Well, good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Are you excited to be at church this morning? I certainly am. I welcome you here to Canton Baptist Temple. I'd like to invite you to stand together this morning as we sing and we worship the Lord together. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Let's sing it together.
God. The Lord our God is. He's ever faithful, never changing. Through the ages, from this darkness, you will lead us. And forever we will say, you're the Lord. Please the Lord our God this morning. Amen. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Well, while we were singing those songs, I could not help but think what a blessing it is to be here today with Canton Baptist Temple. Uh, as a congregation, we can lift up the name of our God and we can worship Him today. And uh, we are blessed to be a part of such a great ministry. Thank you for praying for me last week. I was at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Circleville, Ohio. That's where Pastor Nathan Woodworth is. And uh, he started that church seven years ago with a few believers from Chillicothe. And uh, God has truly blessed that church. They are now running close to 300 people. And uh, good things are happening 
there. We help them uh, during uh, the Christmas season with our Christmas missions offering. Uh, we designated $10,000 to help them uh, with a new building that they hope to build sometime in the near future. They have an auditorium that seats about 150 people, and they're running 300. And so I preached in the early service. I taught Sunday school. I preached again, went out and had lunch, and drove back to Canton, Ohio. But boy, is it ever good to be back home here at Canton Baptist Temple. So glad to be here today. Well, I've got a couple of great, great things that I want to announce. Number one, the total so far for our baby bottle campaign for uh, the Pregnancy and Parenting Center is at $29,792.66. And I believe there are still some bottles that are coming in even today. And I want to really, really encourage you again, bring those bottles back, okay? If you don't bring them back, we have to pay for those baby bottles. So even if it's empty, we prefer for you to put something in it, amen? But even if it's empty, bring those baby bottles back, and that way we can get those turned back into the pregnancy center. But we are so grateful for your generosity, and uh, I tell you what, when we give an offering like that, we are saying with a very loud voice, we are pro-life here at Canton Baptist Temple. And uh, hopefully those dollars are going to be used to be able to allow babies to come into the world. Amen. God has a plan and God has a purpose for their lives. And we're so thankful for your sacrificial giving. Well, yesterday uh, we hosted uh, the Men's Walk Worthy Conference that we do in conjunction with uh, Moody Radio. And uh, wow, we had 1,200 men here. There's a picture of it. 1,200 men right here in the main auditorium. And uh, God really blessed. Uh, At the very closing, Dr. Job, who is the president of Moody Bible Institute, he spoke. And uh, there were several men that got saved yesterday right down front here. And uh, many, many, probably there was around 50 that made spiritual decisions uh, here at the altar. Uh, God was really at work yesterday. And we are so thankful for all the volunteers that made it a reality here. Uh, We had our custodial crew, I'll tell you, Andy and his whole crew working so hard. Our staff was here. We had volunteers from the church that were helping to greet the people, let them know uh, where things were happening and where to go. And uh, I just want you, if you will, give a, a big round of applause to all the volunteers, all who worked so hard to make this happen yesterday. David Miner is going to come and he is going to lead us in prayer asking God's blessing upon this service today. Uh, We believe that God is with us right now in this place. And uh, we believe God's Holy Spirit is going to work today. And so I hope that you will uh, have a heart of expectation that God's going to do something, not only in your heart, but in the hearts of others today, in the hearts of those that are watching live stream right now. We believe that God is at work, and uh, God's going to honor the preaching and teaching of his word today. And David's going to come, and he's going to come, and he's going to pray and ask God to really, truly bless this service today. Let's bow together. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're reminded again that you love a joyful giver, a cheerful giver. Lord, and over the years we've given to this church and the ministry, and we got to see more fruits yesterday with the Walkworthy Conference, where we had the gymnasium, we had the atrium. Uh, we couldn't put on events like that without it, without having it. But we gave and and you blessed and you used it and people got saved. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that we will continue that, that attitude of cheerful giving and that we could see the monies being used to further your kingdom. Lord, we truly pray that you will instill in us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, that we ourselves would want to reach out and bring others into the kingdom of God. Lord, we pray that 
to give us courage, give us faith. We pray for this service today that you will bless the, the, the word that's going to be taught. And Lord, may it resonate with us. May you just stir it up with your spirit. And we put all things into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Let's stand again this morning as we continue to sing and worship the Lord together.
morning, and you may be seated.
Well, I couldn't help but notice behind the choir we have our theme for 2024. As they were singing Believe for it, I was seeing the theme by faith. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? So we have to live by faith, trusting God, believing in Him. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so open the Word of God here this morning to the Gospel of John chapter 19. John chapter 19, I am in a series called Crosswords as we are looking at the seven uh, statements that Jesus made as he hung upon the cross. Today we come to the third statement that Jesus made. Uh, so far we have looked at words of forgiveness, uh, words of salvation, but today we're looking at words of provision. Words of provision. And look please, if you will, at John chapter 19, beginning in verse 25. I want to read down to verse 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. It was the great hymn writer, Fanny Crosby, her portrait hangs in our Christian Hall of Fame. There were many years ago that I inducted her into our Christian Hall of Fame here at Canton Baptist Temple. But she wrote a lot of hymns over the years, and she wrote the hymn near the cross. How many of you remember singing that hymn maybe way back in the day years ago, near the cross? Often we hear someone pray, O oh Lord, keep me near the cross. But here's my question this morning. If we had been in Jerusalem that day when Jesus was crucified, how near the cross would we have been that day? According to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 55, we know that when Jesus was arrested, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Jesus had already said this would happen. As a matter of fact, he mentioned that it would be a fulfillment of prophecy. Mark chapter 14 verse 27, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And that's exactly what happened as the disciples fled and forsook Jesus as he was being crucified. As we will see in a moment, John was the only disciple near the cross that day. According to Matthew 27 and verse 41, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders were all near the cross. They were there mocking Jesus. They were there hurling insults at him. We also know that there were at least four Roman soldiers near the cross. How do we know that? Well, John 19, you're in chapter 19, look at verse 23. Because verse 23 says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, implying that there were four Roman soldiers there near the cross. We also know from our text that there were four women near the cross. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's sister, Salome, was also there. She was the mother of James and John. Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had delivered from seven demons, was there. And Mary, the wife of Cleophas, was there near the cross. Again, we also know that John, uh, the only disciple that was there near the cross, he was there that day. John is the disciple being referred to. Look again at verse 26. And the disciples standing by whom he, that is, whom Jesus loved. By the way, John refers to himself 
five times in the Gospel of John in this way. Once right here in John 19, verse 26. Also in chapter 13, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John refers to himself again in chapter 20, verse 2, as the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Loved. And then again in chapter 21, verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter. And then lastly in chapter 21 and verse 20, which says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee. We know that this is a reference to John. You say, how do we know that? Well, you're in chapter 19. Go to chapter 21, verse 24. Because John himself writes these words, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. John is saying, I am that disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I am the one that is giving testimony to the fact of all these things that have been written. He is saying, I am the one who is writing this testimony. But now I want us to turn our attention to Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is standing there near the cross. I know that we're looking at the death of Jesus here in John chapter 19, but just for a moment, I want to take you back to his birth. In Luke chapter 2, it says that Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem, the Bible says, to present him to the Lord. While they were there, they encountered two individuals, Simeon and Anna. Both had words of prophecy and words of praise for the Lord Jesus. Listen to, though, what Simeon said to Mary in Luke 2 and verse 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. Those words were certainly fulfilled in Mary's life. Even before Jesus was born, when Mary as a virgin was discovered with child, she began to suffer shame and reproach. She was misunderstood and people gossiped about her. No doubt every time someone said something derogatory, it was like a sword was piercing through her soul. When Joseph, Mary, and Jesus had to flee Bethlehem and go down into Egypt. And so many innocent children, two years and under, were killed because of her baby. It was again like a, a sword that was piercing through her soul. When as a young person, Jesus went missing for three days and Joseph and Mary finally find him and he's there at the temple. He's reasoning with the, the scholars of the Old Testament and he looked at his mother and he said, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? I believe at that moment it was like a sword piercing through Mary's soul. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, when Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. It was again like a sword that was piercing through her soul. When she caught wind that the religious leaders of Jerusalem were talking about killing her son Jesus, again, it was like a sword that was piercing through her soul. And now here she is, John chapter 19. She is standing there at Mount Calvary. And I believe she is looking up at the cross, seeing her firstborn son hanging upon that cross. And once again, she felt that sword piercing through her soul. Can you imagine for a moment the pain, the sorrow, the agony? The suffering that Mary was experiencing as she stood there near the cross. Dr. Warren Wearsby makes a very interesting observation. He says, 
that if there was anyone who could have rescued Jesus from the cross that day, it would have been Mary. Now, when I first read those words that Dr. Wearsby wrote, I thought, well, i got to read further on down. What does he mean by that? After all, uh, his point is no one knows a son or a daughter better than their mother. All Mary would have had to do, according to Dr. Wearsby, would have been to walk up to one of those Roman soldiers and said this, Hey, I'm his mother. I know him better than anyone else here. What he is saying is not true. Let him go. Take him off of the cross. But I can't help but notice here in John 19, and by the way, not only here, but also in the account in Matthew and Mark and Luke, that Mary stood near the cross and she stood in silence. There is no record in the Bible of her saying anything as she stood there looking up at Jesus hanging on the cross. I believe that Mary's silence gives testimony to the fact that she knew Jesus was the very Son of God. If Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, then Mary would have, I believe, spoken up and said something, but she didn't. She stood in silence because she knew he was indeed who he claimed to be. You see, when you read the Gospels and you see what Jesus said about himself, you have to come to the conclusion that either Jesus was a liar, Jesus was a lunatic, or number three, he is the Lord Jesus. <laughs> in the words of C.S. Lewis, I quote, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. <laughs> End of quote. Deep down, Mary knew that he wasn't a liar. Deep down, she knew that Jesus was not a lunatic. She knew that when he had said in John chapter 6 and verse 47, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, that Jesus was telling the truth. She knew that when he said in John 14 and verse 9, He that has seen me has seen the Father, that Jesus wasn't crazy. Jesus had not lost his mind. She knew in her heart of hearts that Jesus was God in flesh she remembered what the shepherds had told her concerning the words of the angel of the Lord for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior which is Christ the Lord and so she stood there at the foot of the cross she she stood in silence watching him suffer watching him bleed and eventually watching him take his last breath of air and die on the cross. Let me pause here and say that Mary is to be honored, but Mary is not to be worshipped. I want to be absolutely clear about a couple of things here today. Number one, Mary was not sinless. She understood her need of the Savior because in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 and verse 47, she said, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. I believe that as Mary stood there looking up at Jesus, she knew that he was not only dying for the sins of the world, but he was there dying for her sins as well. You see, just like you and me, Mary was a sinner in need of the Savior. The Roman Catholic Church's teaching concerning the immaculate conception of the blessed virgin Mary is completely false. Jesus was born sinless, but not Mary. Mary was just like you and me, a sinner who needed Jesus as her Savior. Number two, Mary is not the co-redeemer. 
The Roman Catholic Church has elevated Mary to a position of being co-equal with Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you were to go today to Rome, Italy, there is a church that is completely devoted to the worship of Mary. It's called Santa Maria Maggiore Church. Many of you may have visited Rome, Italy, and you have been to see this church. The Italian word Maggiore means great or large. In the courtyard of that church is a, a crucifix that is lifted high up in the air. On one side of the crucifix is a figure of Jesus hanging on the cross being crucified. And on the other side, literally back to back with him, is a figure of Mary with a crown on her head and holding baby Jesus. You talk about blasphemy. The Roman Catholic Church has made Mary into a form of idolatry where people bow down to her, people light candles to her, people worship her, and even people pray to Mary. Listen to me because any kind of deification of Mary is heresy. Jesus himself rebuked any kind of thinking that would elevate Mary to a position of being worshipped. You say, really? Yes. Go to Luke chapter 11. I want you to look at it with me. Look at Luke chapter 11 and two verses, verse 27 and 28. Luke chapter 11, verse 27. And it came to pass as he, that is, as Jesus spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, looked at Jesus and said, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Now, that is a reference to who? Mary, right? That is a reference to Mary. But I want you to notice while this woman is putting the attention on Mary, notice what Jesus says in verse 28. And he said, Yea, rather... Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. <laughs> now notice that Jesus put Mary on the level of every other believer. May I be as clear as I can be today. Mary cannot save you. Mary cannot give you the forgiveness of your sins. Mary cannot answer your prayers. Mary is not the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now, let's focus on these last words. Go back to John 19. These last words that Jesus spoke to Mary. He looks at Mary and he says, Woman, behold thy son. And by the way, thy son is not a reference to himself but rather a reference to John because then he looks at John and he says, Behold thy mother. I believe this third statement by Jesus teaches us at least a couple of very important lessons here today. Number one, we're responsible to take care of our family. As Mary's firstborn son, Jesus was legally responsible for the welfare of his mother. Most Bible commentators agree that by this point, Joseph had already passed away. It seems like Joseph most likely died sometime long before Jesus ever went into his public ministry. Mary was a widow. And so Jesus would have been the one to make sure that her needs were taken care of in her older age. But also we see that Jesus was obeying the fifth commandment. What is the fifth commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus didn't neglect his duty, but instead he assured Mary of his love for her and his care for her. Something that may seem odd to you, that even though Jesus had siblings, he gave the responsibility of caring for his mother to his disciple John. According to Matthew 13, verse 55, we know that Jesus had at least four brothers. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Now, whenever I began to study this and understand that, okay, he's got four brothers, 
why would he not give the responsibility of caring for his widowed mother to one of the brothers? I began to research that. Why? Why, why didn't Jesus appoint one of his brothers to look after Mary? Well, the answer is found in John chapter 7. You're in chapter 19. Go to chapter 7, verse 5. Because this seems to be the answer, and I want to explain where I'm going here. In John chapter 7, verse 5, you have this statement. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Now, it seems that all throughout his earthly ministry, and even up until the time when Jesus was crucified, his half-brothers were still unbelievers. However, we do know that they became believers after the resurrection. How do we know that? Look at Acts chapter 1. You're in John. Go to Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, with his brothers. By the way, we know that one of his half-brothers, James, went on to become the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. But my point is this, Jesus understood the obligation that he had to care for his mother and he fulfilled that obligation by designating the disciple whom he loved, John, to take care of her. Secondly, sorrow comes to even those whom Jesus loves. Now I want to sort of spend a little time on this point this morning because this is something that is certainly applicable to all of us who are here today. I'm convinced that this third statement here in John chapter 19, this third statement by Jesus proves the fact that he loved his mother Mary, right? I believe that he did. He loved his mother Mary. Think about it because here's Jesus hanging on the cross and unbelievable agony. He's literally struggling to breathe. In order to breathe, to get a, a good dose of air, oxygen into his lungs, he's having to literally push himself up on the cross just to grasp a, a little bit of air in order to breathe. And at some point while he's hanging on this cross, he glances down and I believe that he locks eyes with his mother Mary. Mary is at the foot of the cross. She's near the cross. And he looks down from the cross and all of the unimaginable agony and suffering that he's going through and he makes eye contact with his mother Mary. Now no doubt she is emotionally distraught she is heartbroken. I can see her standing there crying. And maybe the other women were wrapping their arms around Mary and trying to console her and minister to her as she stood there at the foot of the cross. But Jesus looked down at her and he knew that his impending death was about to crush Mary's heart. She had experienced over and over again the truth of Simeon's statement. It would be like a sword that would pierce through her soul. As Bible commentator Arthur Pink said, if Christ was the man of sorrows, was she not the woman of sorrows? <laughs> Good observation. Mary was experiencing unimaginable sorrow. She had been through some difficult times in her life, but, but nothing of this magnitude. She had been a great mother to Jesus. She had been there to hear his first words and to, to watch him take his, his first steps and no doubt taught him how to read and how to write. She had protected him, comforted him, encouraged him, helped him, and supported him like any good mother would do for her son. She had always been there for him. Mary loved Jesus, and Jesus loved Mary. And as he was dying on that cross, because he loved his mother, Jesus was concerned about her future. Please don't misunderstand that term woman that Jesus uses to address his mother. In our culture today, 
we would think of that as being very cold and disrespectful. I would have never looked at my mother and said, woman? <laughs> oh, my. <clears throat> Probably my dad would have given me the backhand at that point. But in the New Testament culture, it was not cold. It was not disrespectful. It was a title of respect, much the way we would say the word today, ma'am. I know we don't use that as much up north as we do down south. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. But Jesus was aware of the, of the sorrow and the, the anguish of soul that, that Mary was experiencing. And that's why I believe he, he spoke these words to her from the cross. He was demonstrating his love and his concern for her. Now listen to me because Jesus loves you, right? And yes, you love Jesus, but that doesn't mean that you are exempt from pain, from sorrow, from hurt, from the sufferings of life. Mary was not exempt and neither are we. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that when we experience bad things in our life that it is a sign of God's disfavor. Right? Have you heard that? There may be even some preachers out there using that prosperity, uh, that health and wealth gospel message. And when they're always talking about how they are enjoying God's favor. <laughs> right? Have you heard that? Am I hitting on a sensitive spot here? you gotten quiet on me. All right? But I want you to know that when we go through bad things in life, it does not mean anything about God's disfavor. That's not true. You say, what do you mean? Let's not forget what the angel said in Luke chapter 1 verse 28. He said that Mary was what? Highly favored. <laughs> not just favored, highly favored. Do you remember that? that that's part of the, the birth of Jesus that we talk about. Here he is hanging on the cross and he's looking down at his mother. Highly favored. And she is experiencing unimaginable pain and suffering, turmoil of soul, agony within her as she sees her firstborn son hanging upon that cross. Nothing that she can do about it. She stands there in silence. And yet over and over again, throughout the Bible and the Gospels, we see the one who is highly favored who felt the sword piercing through her soul. One thing is for sure. When you walk through the deep, dark valleys of life, and if you'll keep your eye on Jesus and you'll listen closely, you'll hear his voice of comfort just like Mary did as she was standing there at the foot of the cross. Jesus loved Mary and by the way, Jesus loves you, and he loves me. And when we go through the deep, deep waters of life, the Lord sees us, and he speaks to us, and he provides us with exactly what we need at that very moment. Jesus looked down from the cross at two people that he loved very much, and he said to his mother Mary, Woman, ma'am, behold thy son. And then he looked over at John and said, behold thy mother. We know that his hands were nailed to the cross so you wonder if he was making that gesture with his eyes or, or with his head as he was motioning one to the other, making that connection. Out of love, Jesus spoke these words of provision. Think about it because love is always focused on meeting the needs of others. That's why Jesus willingly gave his life as a sacrifice on the cross. Why is that? Because he loves us. Jesus loved you so much that he died for you on the cross. Jesus provided us with the way of salvation. 
He provided us with the the way to have and to experience the forgiveness of all of our sins. He provided us with the, the gift of eternal life. He provided us with a personal relationship with God. God is now our heavenly Father because of our faith in Him. He provided us with an eternal home in heaven. And all of these things and even more has he given to us. He has provided to us. How? When we put our faith and our trust in him and what he accomplished on that old rugged cross. If you have not made that life-changing decision to receive by faith Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today. I want you to know that just like Jesus provided for Mary, he's provided for you. Every good thing that you and I enjoy as Christians today is because of the cross. It's because of the cross. Jesus met all of our needs at the cross. And you and I today need to thank God For his gift of Jesus. You and I would still be lost in our sins. If God had not sent his only begotten son Jesus into the world to die for us. And as he was hanging on that cross. He was not only thinking about his executioners. When he said father forgive them for they know not what they do. He was even thinking about the other thief. There were two thieves, the one thief on the cross that did truly repent of his sin and believed in Jesus. And he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But then he, he looked down at his mom and he provided what she needed at that moment. Words of comfort, words of love, words of assurance. And I want you to know that while he was on that cross, he was not only thinking about his executioners. He was not only thinking about that thief on the cross. He was not only thinking about that disciple whom he loved and his mother Jesus, or his mother Mary. He was thinking about you and me. Jesus had you on his mind when he died. And you and I today need to understand something. The cross is a symbol of love. As horrific as the cross, the crucifixion was, when we think as Christians about the cross, we're thinking about love. Jesus willingly gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? For most of you, that will be an emphatic yes. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that there was a point in your life, a time where you said, I realize I am a sinner. I can't save myself. Religion can't save me. Only Jesus can save me. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me is what Jesus said. And so has there been a point in time when you realize Jesus is the only Savior and you have repented of your sin And you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've invited him to come into your heart and into your life. Become Lord and Savior of your life. Are you there today? Are you at that point where you can say, He is, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. If not, I pray that today will be the day of your salvation. Don't leave here lost. There were some men that came down yesterday and they got saved here at the front of this altar. Today, that may need to be your story, your testimony, where you say, I came on the very first Sunday of March of 2024 to Canton Baptist Temple and I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Whatever spiritual decision you need to make today, salvation, baptism, maybe giving your life back to the Lord again, rededicating yourself to him maybe church membership maybe you need to come and pray about a need in your life today I don't know what it might be but whatever it is do God's will in your life today don't leave this building with regrets 
leave this building today having joy and peace in your heart that you have done exactly as the Spirit of God has led you to do today. Amen? Let's stand together, please. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and everyone is not searching the heart and life of another person, but you're thinking about your own spiritual condition today. What decision do you need to make? If you are here today and you say, Preacher, I need to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I know that I need to make that decision. And Preacher, I want you to pray that God will give me the courage to make that decision today. Would you raise your hand high to the air if you say, I know I need Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Anybody like that here at all? Main floor, up in the balcony, young person, older person middle-aged person doesn't matter who you are Jesus died on the cross for you if you're here today and you say I need to make that decision I I need to accept Christ as my personal Savior I want to encourage you right now just slip out of your place and come down here to this altar we've got men and women who are counselors who will help you in making that very important decision in your life today. Maybe you say, I know I'm saved, preacher. I I just have not taken that first step of obedience and been baptized. You say, I need to be baptized. That's that's a decision I need to make. Would you raise your hand high into the air and say, I know I'm saved, but I've not been scripturally baptized by immersion. I know that's a decision that I need to make in my life today. Is there somebody like that who lifted hand? Say, preacher, pray for me. I need the courage to step out and to make that decision today. Why don't you come? Come right now. Make that decision in your life. Enjoy the victory, the joy, the peace of knowing that you have done exactly what God wants you to do. Maybe today you need to join our church. Maybe today you need to come and lay that heavy burden down here at the altar. I don't know what decision you need to make, but I'm praying for God's will to be accomplished in your life today. I would hate for you to leave here the same way that you came into this building today. Whatever God wants you to do, do it. Heavenly Father, work in this invitation, we pray. May your power be evident in our hearts and in our lives, and we'll give you the thanks for it. Robert's going to play through another verse. Are there others? There's many decisions that are being made today, and we're going to rejoice with these individuals in just a moment. But if you're one of those who needs to come, this is your opportunity. Last chance to come this morning and make that spiritual decision that you know God wants you to make.
thank you and you may be seated so thankful again that you've been here today to worship with us at Canton Baptist Temple. I hope that you are leaving here blessed and encouraged and challenged by what you have heard and what you have seen today. I want to finish uh, with a few announcements today. As you exit the auditorium today, uh, we have men that are standing at all the doorways, and they have got a packet of missionary prayer letters. Uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, and we always hand out uh, the packet of missionary prayer letters. And uh, we support 150 missionaries' projects around the world, and we believe it's important to pray for our missionaries. So please grab a packet today, take those letters home, read through them, and pray for our missionaries by name. Also, join us on Wednesday evenings, choir practice, 6.30, right here in the main auditorium, 6.45, we have our Roots program for the boys and girls, uh, ages two years old through the fifth grade, and then at seven o'clock we have middle school, high school, college ministry taking place, and also two electives that are being taught. Uh, we have uh, Lewis McClendon teaching in the Henniger Ministry Center. The topic is Lord, increase my faith. And then Jake is in the Peaceful Harbor Room, just the, the room down from the chapel there, and he is teaching on living the Christian life according to the commandments of Christ. And I really encourage you to be back on Wednesday night. Also, we have a Wednesday evening meal uh, for your convenience from 5.30 to 6.30. It takes place in the atrium. Uh, the menu is on the screen. The tickets are for sale today over in the north hallway. Uh, Mike Fisher will be there. And uh, please get your ticket uh, today. Also, this is the first Sunday in March. But the last Sunday in March, March has five Sundays this year, the fifth Sunday is Easter. And we have our invite cards available. Uh, we have these wrapped up in bundles of five. Uh, they're located down front here on the pews. They're at the welcome centers. They're out in the front lobby. I want to encourage you to pick up a pack of these invite cards and begin to invite people to come and to be here at Canton Baptist Temple on Easter Sunday. I'll tell you this, they will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ over that weekend. From Good Friday, which is March the 29th, our service is at 7 o'clock. And then that Sunday morning, we'll have two identical services. So choose a service. I, I told my ABF class you can come to the 8 o'clock service. And then uh, we have no Sunday school ABFs. You can go to the gym and you can enjoy a free continental breakfast. Or you can come to the free breakfast and then... Uh, stay and attend the second service at 1015. I said notice that there was not a third option and the third option would be just to come for breakfast and go home. All right. I better not catch any of you doing that on Easter Sunday. All right. We've got cameras around here and we will find out who you are. All right. Either come to the early service at eight, stay for the breakfast or come to the breakfast and then stay for the 1015 service. The 8 o'clock and 1015 are identical. Uh, the only difference is at 8 o'clock we have no child care. All right, no child care at 8 o'clock. So yeah, I encourage you, let's begin to invite people to come and to be here over Easter weekend. Uh, the, all the stats prove that if we will just invite somebody to come, chances are they will come. The problem is we're not doing the inviting. So let me encourage you, do your part and let God do the rest, all right? You do your part. We're running into people all throughout the week. How many of you are going to go out at some point to eat this week? Quit lying and raise your hand, all right? I love you. Yeah, you know you are. And uh, give it to the person at the restaurant, maybe the person who's waiting on you or checking you out or maybe somebody you see there at the restaurant, maybe somebody you know while you're out during the week and they need to be in church, I encourage you to use the uh, invite cards. Also, uh, please uh, be in prayer for the Rayner family. Uh, Brenda Rayner went home to be with the Lord. Uh, she's been a member of our church now for a number of years, over 20 years. 
Her son is Benji. Uh, they have been a part of our deaf ministry. And uh, we certainly want to be much in prayer that God would comfort the family. Also, I want to remind everybody who bought a ticket. If you do not have a ticket, please do not go to the gym. <laughs> All right? But we have the spaghetti dinner that is a fundraiser for our high school kids that are going down to Nicaragua on a mission trip. That is today. Okay? So if you have your ticket, join us. If you don't have a ticket, we did not make enough for you. Okay? So uh, if you bought a ticket for the spaghetti dinner right after the service, just head down uh, the hallway there in the north uh, and then go straight through the atrium on into the gym, if you will. All right, Jake, come if you will. Let's mention uh, some of the spiritual decisions being made today, and then we'll be dismissed. We have two decisions to make public this morning. First is Katina Sanford. Katina, if you could stand for me real quick. Uh, after ABF class this morning, Dave and Penny Lavin, good letter to the Lord. And she's also coming for baptism today. So let's praise the Lord for that decision. And you can be seated. And then Hayden Cox. Hayden's right over here. And uh, Logan's dealt with him this morning. He knows Jesus as his Savior. And he's coming to present himself for baptism today. So let's praise the Lord for his decision as well. All right, you can stand. Oh, we have one more decision. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, sir. We have Thomas Cox and Trent dealt with him this morning, and uh, they need to have a little quiet place, so they went out into the hallway, and uh, Thomas Cox received the Lord as his Savior this morning. So praise the Lord for that. All right, you can stand, and you can go in peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great day.